Greetings, Honorable Speaker, Professor Nadia Woods, Honorable Moderator, Tashu Sim Topke, and online guests. Welcome to Jishinka's virtual seminar series on the use of AI and innovative solutions to support good governance. The series is organized by the Center for Bhutan and GN Studies in collaboration with the International Society for Bhutan Studies. We are delighted to create a platform for debate and discourses on approaches and methods to incorporate AI into the good governance. This is especially pertinent during a time when we are constantly faced with new challenges from the global pandemic, whilst also being in a state of hyper-connectedness through technology. In the midst of numerous uncertainties, we are now compelled to find new ways to enhance public service delivery and good governance. For today's session, we are delighted to welcome our esteemed moderator, Tashu Sring Topke, former Prime Minister of Bhutan. Tashu served as the leader of the first democratic opposition party in the National Assembly of Bhutan from 2008 to 2013, and as a Prime Minister from 2013 to 2018. With the transition to democracy in 2008, Tashu was responsible for establishing the first registered political party in Bhutan and served as its president. Tashu is a passionate advocate of cross-national happiness and has spoken movingly on conservation, climate change, poverty, democracy, and happiness. Thus, it is with great pleasure for the CBS team and our esteemed audience to welcome Tashu Tsingtopke. The screen is yours, La. Thank you. Thank you very much, Song. A very warm welcome to all the participants today. I see so many of you. Uh, I recognize many faces from Bhutan, uh, and I see many faces from outside Bhutan. So a warm welcome to everybody. I am delighted to be taking part in this uh, seminar series organized by uh, the Center for Bhutan Studies and the International Society for Bhutan Studies. Uh, I'm extremely delighted to be given the opportunity to moderate today's discussion because we have with us someone that I have wanted to meet personally for a very long time, Professor Nairi Woods. Uh, professor Nairi uh, is a professor at the Oxford University. And now, as many of you would know, Oxford has been around for more than a thousand years. And during those thousand years, Oxford has sought to teach many leaders, including global leaders. And yet it took a person like Nairi to establish a dedicated center within Oxford for the teaching, of, for the teaching and learning of governance. So Professor Nairi is a founding dean of the Blatnevec School of Government in Oxford. And she's an expert in governance, but she's an expert in multilateralism, uh, in international cooperation and global economic institutions. She's a highly sought after speaker. And she uses uh, these platforms in the w uh, World Economic Forum and other international platforms to talk about multilateralism, globalization, public policy, technology, values. And she's backed up her ideas through a range of books and articles that she's authored and she's appeared on many international, internationally renowned television programs, particularly with the uh, BBC. So I'm not going to go on and on about Nairi Woods because many of you here today are joining us because you've heard of Nairi Woods and I'm sure you've read about her. And for those who want to learn a lot, uh, well, there's a lot to learn about uh, Nairi and what she has accomplished. Uh, and for those of you who want to know a bit more, we will, I will make sure that the show notes to today's programs will include links to her biography and uh, her accomplishments, including links to many of the interesting talks that she has uh, taken part in. So uh, Nairi, a very warm welcome to Bhutan, unfortunately virtually, but nonetheless a warm welcome to Bhutan. 
Today's talk topic is uh, technology and values in governance. Technology and values in governance. Uh, I want to begin. I want to start at the beginning with governance and government. I mean, we think of we take governments for granted today. No society today can exist without a government. Yet it must have had a beginning. I mean, I think of Egypt, ancient Egypt, and the pharaohs. Can you tell us briefly about the genesis of government and how society agreed to hand over powers to a select few to govern the rest? Thank you, um, Rashad Sering, Top Gates. Such a pleasure to be with you all. I only wish I were there in Bhutan, um, possibly the most beautiful and certainly the most carbon neutral country in the world. <laughs> and um, thank you for joining um, today. Um, people do often think of ancient Egypt as a, as a heart of government, and they think about the system of pharaohs. Um, and the pharaonic system is one kind of government very centralized, very hierarchical. I like to remember that even before ancient Egyptian governments, we saw, and we've got archeological evidence of government in places like Sumeria, which today we would call Iraq, in India, Harappan um, civilizations, just to remind ourselves, and it's, this is really important for a school of government that's in the United Kingdom, that actually the United Kingdom has always had to learn from every other region in the world, from the Middle East, from India, from China, from Japan, from the places where the earliest governments formed. And they formed for a simple reason. And that's that human beings can live in harmony. But as we all know, you know, hands up, who has a family in which there has never been a single argument? You know, <laughs> I don't think anyone could say that. So human beings, you know, they, they, because we need, um, we need to trust that somebody will be a keeper of very simple rules, which enable us to be the best part of ourselves. And that's the genesis of government in its most simplest. A keeper of rules and uh, simple rules, uh, beginning with Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa through Mesopotamia, Egypt, and uh, all the learning that, uh, England uh, acquired and implemented and imposed, I might add, in many other parts of the world uh, till today. Uh, these rules have changed. And I would imagine government structures have changed and the purpose of government have changed. I wonder, Nairi, if you can walk us through the big changes that the world has seen in government from the hierarchical structure of the pharaohs till today, what we consider as government? So it's a, it's a wonderful question because it almost assumes that there's been a kind of evolution of government, but that's definitely not how I see it. I see it much more as cycles. You know, I, I'm, it's not so clear to me that so much has changed in the way that government works. There are two core things that the governors and the governed have always wrestled with. And the first is, and, and that's, that's to say, yeah, the, the, the first is, what is the mixture of coercion and consent that I will use to govern? So in, to what degree can I force people to obey me because most of them are slaves and the rest rely on my patronage? And to what extent can I govern by consent because the people consent for me to make decisions that help them lead better lives. And government throughout these several thousand years we're talking about has always been a balancing of those two things. And that takes it due to a, a second thing, which is the people's question, why should I trust this person? Why should I trust this person to govern us? Is it because she's the same race as me? Is it because she's the same religion? Is it because she plows the fields next to mine? Those questions have always been there. And of course, one answer is because I'm the grandest and the richest and the most powerful, and hence all the trappings of state. And the other answer is because I can be trusted, because I'm living through what I have promised to you, which is a system of consent. And, and to me, the other, the other big issue that we see going round in circles is 
on what basis should government decide to distribute what are scarce goods? You know, because human conflict arises at its most basic as conflict over resources, over water, over food, over status and how status is apportioned, um, over family uh, relations, and the basis on which those decisions are made, which might be religious, it might be secular, it might be sets of rules that emerge and form a culture. So, and when I think about it, Saring, these three things I've seen move in cycles. You know, there are some things from ancient civilizations that they got wrong that we're still getting wrong today. And there are some things that they got right that we're still getting right today. But it feels to me as though it moves in cycles. And most countries have periods of what we would think of as relatively more accountable or democratic government and relatively and other periods of relatively more coercive um, authoritarian government. <clears throat> A government not evolving, but going around in cycles uh, sounds good to me, yet it sounds also disturbing. Uh, it rings of making the same mistakes over and over again. Uh, if you were to learn from your mistakes, you'd assume that the cyclical nature of different types of government uh, would not happen. Uh, has there been big, we, we think of revolutions. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, revolutions are generally a ch drastic change in government mm -hmm. and authoritarian dictator, dictator is brought down by the people and uh, a different type of government, whether it's democracy or communism is instated in its place. Uh, that's revolution. But has there been some big transformative, transformative moments in the history of government, I'm thinking again, almost linearly, like uh, in economic revolutions from uh, farming to mechanization, to mass production, to internet now. Uh, in government, is there any big, big transformative ideas that have taken place? Um, well, I think, I think, on the first thing, I think the reason we see the cycle is because human beings have an extraordinary capacity to, um, to be expedient and to overestimate coercive power. They think if I just force this person to submit to my power, then I can do what I like. And, and of course, the more, the more a politician in any country, whether a king, a queen, a politician or a sultan, the more they move to believing that they have total power and can do what they like, and they no longer have to court the consent of those they governed, the more they head towards their own toppling. It's an almost inevitable cycle because human beings don't actually suffer coercion for too long. You know, it's, it's a, and it's a trap because it looks so easy. If only I had all the power, I could do everything that I think is either right or, or, or comfortable for myself. And so we see systems move more and more and more into coercion, and then they get toppled. They don't always get toppled by a less coercive system, but they get toppled. And I think that's an interesting evolution. To me, an, an incredibly important part of it, and we're seeing this today in countries and I can think of a couple of dozen countries in the world where leaders have, for good reasons often, said, I am such a wise leader and I'm doing such a good job that I should extend my tenure so that I rule lifelong. And there's a huge problem to this that they don't see. And, and some of them are very well intentioned. And that problem is, that the minute the rest of your political system, the minute your society think that you're in power lifelong, they stop telling you what you need to hear. It's like the emperor who, wear, who wore no clothes and nobody dared to tell the emperor that he was naked. That is what happens. Your advisors stop telling you what you need to hear and start only telling you what you want to hear. Your family, your court, your ministers, your governors, 
become more and more corrupt because they start feeling that this is their one, this is their time to eat. This is their chance to get rich. And then when you when you pass on, somebody else comes in and it will be somebody else's turn. And so you get a system that becomes both less informed and more corrupt. And that's that's not stable. And that's what creates the cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, Nari, you mentioned coercion and consent mm -hmm. as not necessarily a basis of governance, but also what drives this cyclical nature of governments. Uh, I want to share with you a very interesting transformation in government uh, that has taken place in our own country, uh, an experiment, if you will. So we uh, have been blessed by enlightened monarchs and we love our kings. And uh, our fourth king, His Majesty Jigmi Singh Wangchuk, uh, started devolving power and authority from the throne to his ministers and then to a uh, decentralized structure. And, uh, and then he himself stepped down at the ripe old age of 51 years uh, and his, uh, the crown prince uh, became king, our fifth king, our current king. And the crown prince oversaw the completion of a constitution uh, that formed the basis for the imposition of a democracy in Bhutan. And I say the imposition of a democracy because the kings had the people's consent to govern them. But our kings and our king refused to continue or refused to coerce the people and therefore insisted that we must have a democracy in Bhutan. And so today we are a vibrant democracy with all the uh, uh, democratic institutions that are required in a young democracy, a healthy democracy. But just as a side note, uh, Naira, I mentioned uh, this transformation in government that has taken place in Bhutan. Uh, can you tell me a bit about the social compact between the, governor, the government and the government and the values that drive such social compacts uh, uh, today? and perhaps the evolution, if there is one. Um, so the this, this social compact is, is, I guess if we look at the two extremes of a social compact, we can start understanding what it comprises. So I'll start with the negative and then go to the positive. So the negative social compact, um, when I think about the Arab Spring and why um, a government system in countries that had been established for several decades broke down. There had been a compact in countries, so the Arab Spring began in Tunisia when the people overthrew um, um, their president. And the so social compact that was broken was a compact that said, and, and it was across several governments, we, I will be leader, I will be president, and I will ensure that I deliver to you all jobs, even if the jobs aren't very worthwhile and, and a certain standard of living. And in return, you will accept that I do what I like. So very high levels of corruption, very high levels of enrichment at the top of the country. And that system only worked for as long as he could, as Ben Ali could keep delivering on that promise. And it was the same in Egypt and the same in other countries, right? So it worked as long as he could keep delivering. But when you had a global financial crisis in 2008 and suddenly the authoritarian leader could no longer deliver on his side of the compact, the people rose up and said, well, you're not delivering your side of the bargain. So we're not delivering ours. And suddenly the deep corruption that had been there for a couple of, you know, for decades became very, very apparent to the people and they rose up and overthrew that government. And that, that's an example of a social compact that broke. A very different social compact that I would point to is the interesting example here in the United Kingdom after the Second World War. When Winston Churchill came back from leading the country in a war that had been victorious, remember the Winston Churchill victory sign. And it was just assumed that he would win the, the election in 1945, just as the war ended. After all, he'd been victorious in war. Why would he not win the election? And instead, the British people 
refused to vote for him and voted in their majority for a different prime minister, for Clement Attlee. A surprising choice, a very, not a charismatic man, not some great heroic leader, but rather a leader who promised a population who had suffered a lot during the war, that he would build a new Britain, that there would be free health service, free good quality education, that there would be decent housing, that this would take time, it wouldn't be instant, but that this would be the new social compact between the British government and the people. Now, what held the British government honest to that compact was the communist threat as they saw it in, 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 in the Soviet Union. And so to me, it's very interesting when we think about the social compact because it's a compact between a leader and people, but often to keep the leadership honest, you need some kind of competition from other countries, from other systems um, and from within the country. That's what keeps our leaders honest. They can't be too completely convinced of, of their power. And that's what's so interesting about what's happened in Bhutan. Because when a leader has the courage to delegate and devolve power, what they're doing is saying, I trust you all to hold me to account and I trust you all to make decisions. And that doesn't mean the decisions will always be good. I mean, democracy is famously messy, difficult, slow, often makes terrible decisions. But the essence of democracy is that it is a way to constrain that human expedience that leads people to take power and then almost accidentally to keep clinging to it until they can no longer rule very well because no one will tell them what they need to hear. But Churchill came back. Yes, of course. But it was a different Churchill. You know, it was a, it was, you're absolutely right. But by then, what, Brit what had been established in Britain was a very different social compact. And he had to rule within that new social compact. Mm -hmm. And uh, the compact also, the social compact, I think can be both positive and negative. We've seen in our recent times, even in the most developed countries, what we consider to be the most developed and advanced countries, social compacts being offered at the extreme uh, and dividing the country, uh, dividing their countries, or social compacts being offered at such extremes that those promises can never be delivered. Mm. And uh, uh, yeah, is this spreading? Mm. Is this form of government and politics actually spreading? Is there any check to that? Well, you've highlighted two problems, which I think are, are um, important, but different. And so one is the problem where instead of a so social compact, you just have patronage. You say, I will buy off the people on my side, and then I will serve just those people. And the second, which is, um, you know, the promises that politicians make. That, that you know, we will do everything for everybody and then they fail and they create huge disaffection and alienation. And, and we've seen that over the last couple of decades. And we've seen it, I, in my view, what has driven the, the really seismic shift in the, some of the oldest democracies in the world, including you know, Britain, democracies within the European, continent, although obviously they haven't been continuous democracies, um, and, and the United States, where we've seen a real backlash against government. We've seen a backlash against the establishment. And to me, at one part of that backlash lies in the spiraling inequality in these countries. Um, and when I say it's a spiraling inequality, it's not, it's not necessarily a Gini coefficient inequality. It's much more a sense that people have that there is a small percentage at the top who now command huge, huge wealth, far greater than before. So, you know, 30 years ago, a very small percentage of um, um, the most wealthy 400 Americans would have commanded very small percentage of the country's GDP. Today, it's more than 17%. Or, um, you know, 30 years ago, 
a, chief, a CEO of a, of a major American company would have earned about 40 times what his or her rank and file worker earned. Today, it's more than 250 times. And that's an inequality that people feel and they see every time they look at Instagram, every time they go on TikTok, every time they turn to social media, they can see that inequality. They can see the person that works in their own firm but happens to work at the top of it, getting into their private jet, you know, sitting in, in island resorts with their families and they, they feel that inequality and it drives a sense that government is no longer about governing for the public interest, but is about feathering the nests of a small group of people. And that makes it very difficult for politicians because without the trust of the people, it's actually quite difficult for them to restore you know, a governing for all people. It's too easy for them then to resort to buying off certain parts of the, of the, of the population and starting to use what I call the crack cocaine of politics which is exclusive nationalism, which is the politics of race, of religion, of, of individual identities, where you say your own, you know, you can only trust the person that looks like you and, and, and prays like you, um, and you start dividing communities. And we're seeing the, the results of that kind of division in too much conflict in too many countries. So how can governments better use values to counter, to address these divisions? Mm -hmm. And more specifically, how can technology be harnessed to use, to, 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 to push forward those values in, uh, in governments today? Yeah, so technology, technology is a really tricky one because it's got two sides. It's like a two-edged sword, a good side and a bad side. Um, go right back to humankind's first technologies, you know, the plow that could help a human being plow a field. Once you had a plow that could be drawn by human beings, you had, the, you had immediately, and we see this in the archaeological evidence, you have human beings starting to hire other human beings or to enslave them to use that plow. And of course, the human being that had, the, you know, that started with one plow and soon had 10 and soon had a workforce of 50, was a human being who was getting very rich and beginning to make more and more use of people who, would be, who were becoming less, either not paid or lesser paid. And so the great convenience of the plow and the possibility of farming at greater, much greater advantage to produce much more food, on the one hand, brought with it the challenge of how you begin to govern a society where some people are becoming very wealthy and others are becoming very poor and those and those the contrast is very clear what's fascinating my my colleagues in archaeology show us that the the transformation of small settlements where human beings lived side by side in houses that were the same size and we can see that from the archaeological evidence to you start getting these technologies which make some people very wealthy and, and, and at first the wealthy start building hidden food storage under their house. And we can see the archeological remains as they're trying to hide their wealth. And then they start building their own settlements. So you see the huge magnificent palaces in one part of the city and the small hovels of the people working for them in another. That challenge is with us today. As we look at Silicon Valley's billionaires who commandeer more wealth than the GDPs of some entire countries. And we see millions of people, you know, there are, there are literally millions of households in the United States that do not have running water. And that's all in the same, all in the same country. This is not a new problem, it's an old problem. So how do we deal with this? Well, it's two things for me. It's using technology for good, so starting to use technology to solve some of those problems of inequality, but it's also the values of the people who are benefiting from technology, which, which simply need an urgent reset. And we're already seeing that, where some leaders in technology have really understood that, that their success carries with it huge responsibility. Well, here, yeah. Our governance 
has been based on a development philosophy we call gross national happiness. Mm -hmm. While most countries measure the, uh, measure the uh, uh, purpose of government, mm -hmm. the achievements of government through GDP, here it's a bit more holistic and we talk of gross national happiness, uh, not just economic growth. Uh, I've been wrestling with how will, how can we use technology now, today's technology, the state of the art technology to further the ideals of GNH and government uh, and whether it even can be done. Uh, can technology be disruptive to values in government? So the, a technologist might say to you that technology provides you with a perfect way to measure happiness because technologists are beginning to use facial recognition to identify the muscles which produce um, reactions in our face that suggest happiness. Um, I have to say that that sounds completely perverse to me. Because if a human being is spending all day looking at a device which is measuring their happiness, to me, it's almost by definition that we now know that they're becoming less and less happy. And so for me, there's two very interesting um, parts to this. And again, it's using technology for good, but also understanding the damage that technology can, can cause. On the one hand, I see a body of evidence coming out of um, psychology laboratories around the world that tells us that the more time people spend on their screen, the more fragile they become, the less happy they become, the less resilient they become, the higher their anxiety and the less their resilience to things like suicide. And that's, what, that's, the, that's the negative side. And on the positive side, my, my friends and researchers in technology assure me that on that same little device that is causing this anxiety and unhappiness, we can, we can have programs that help people to meditate better, that help people to, to um, uh, find their own path to happiness. What I find interesting as a mother of children is that is watching teenagers use their devices to buy an app which shuts off their phone for eight hours. <laughs> you know, so, so, you know, some part of happiness is going to be about shutting those phones off, I think. <laughs> well, all of us have, uh, are struggling with this pandemic and have had to deal with technology, at least those of us fortunate enough to be able to afford technology, uh, have, been, uh, have had technology in our faces in our, and in our hands uh, nonstop. Uh, for the last uh, more than 20, uh, for the last 20 odd months now. And uh, on a related note on this pandemic, on COVID, I want to ask you, what is your assessment on how governments the world over have responded to uh, uh, the pandemic, number one? Yeah. Related to that, will the COVID pandemic transform some governments? Can it transform governments? So one of, the, one of the things that we've seen very clearly, if I can pick up on our technology and trust discussion, is that um, uh, some governments thought that technology and for example, in um, in, in actually in several continents, they thought that you could contain the pandemic by creating an app which would track people and which would tell them when to isolate. What's been very interesting learning in that, if I take the United Kingdom, is that, that the technology never works without trusted human connection. So Britain spent 35 billion pounds creating a testing and tracing system, which had which used technology. So they tried to build an app and have a nationalized system which would deliver information and, and then use call centers to tell people when to isolate. And it just didn't work. Now, why did it not work? It didn't work because 
what the evidence from China and Vietnam and countries that have been more successful shows us is that you need a human being that you know to knock on your door and say, you need to stay home. And by the way, do you need food? And, and that human element has been crucial. So systems that have failed are the systems that are not using the trusted human element. The vaccine system in Britain has been a terrific success overcoming vaccine hesitancy in many communities. Why? Because the vaccine task force have put money locally. They've trusted people to use mosques, to use churches, to use community centers, to use trusted doctors to be the people delivering the vaccines. And that's a learning. At first they thought we'll just have huge centers and everybody will go there because they trust us. Not always. You've got to go to what people trust because otherwise their distrust will have them staying home and not being vaccinated. So it's been, to me, the, the story of the pandemic is a story of, on the one hand, how extraordinary technology is that we could sequence the genome of the virus and come up with a vaccination so quickly, manufacture it in a difficult biological process so quickly, and then start vaccinating people who trusted that it was safe to be vaccinated so quickly the Chinese vaccine, the Russian vaccine, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, the American vaccines, they've all done that. Now what we're seeing is a challenge both to values and to technology. So we're seeing a challenge of values around people being expedient and thinking if we just vaccinate ourselves, we'll be fine. So the rich countries can vaccinate themselves and just close off the rest and they'll be fine, they'll be safe. Of course, it's not working. And people are starting to realize that that doesn't work. That the longer this virus stays in active infection, the, the, the more it will mutate and the less safe the vaccinated populations will be. So even the amoral person who doesn't care about people dying in India cannot afford to say, I'm safe with my vaccine. Let's just keep people that have been in India out of our country. They can't afford to do that because by, by not helping contain the virus in India, by not vaccinating people in India, they're putting themselves at risk as well. So I think the world will change. It will change. It will change. My hope is that a first change we'll see is a humility in countries like the United Kingdom and the United States, which thought that they were so well prepared to contain a pandemic, they ranked themselves one and two in the world for pandemic preparedness in 2019. And then they very quickly, they were the first countries to fall over and not contain the pandemic because the politicians just said, this won't touch us. So there was a huge complacency at the heart of government. Well, that and what you had mentioned earlier, the overtrust on technology in governance. While technology has served in developing the right tools and the right science, the right vaccines, and is working on the right cures, uh, but in terms of actual governance, uh, people seem to prefer the trusted human element. And if that is the case, this is a lesson for us in Bhutan. As we grapple with how we can bring in uh, digital governance all the time, how we can use technology to improve uh, governance in Bhutan, that we must not forget the trusted human element uh, is absolutely required. And as it has been proven in Bhutan's case, that the trusted human element, as you call it, has worked in keeping the pandemic under control so far in Bhutan. Uh, but what has the pandemic, how has it affected globalization? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, multilateralism. Yeah. So there's the practical effect. You know, people always describe globalization as the genie that you can't put back into the bottle. But of course, each global crisis shows us that it goes very quickly back into the bottle. You know, that that the pandemic caused global trade to seize up just as the global financial crisis did, that borders are closed, that, that um, people are talking about vaccine passports, that, that the world is more cyclical 
than, than those who would argue that globalization is an inexorable force would, would believe. I think, I think there's two things that there's two trends that we're seeing. One is the need for global action, for example, on vaccines and the need for global cooperation on um, financing the build back from COVID. And there I'm, I'm both optimistic that, that that is being understood too slowly, but it is being understood and there is action that's being taken. At the same time, there are too many people saying this, this COVID, the, COVID, the pandemic has to be solved at the global level. We need global rules, global institutions and global enforcement. And there I would say, stop, wait, what have we learned about local resilience? What have we learned about building from the bottom up? We've learned in this pandemic that the best containment, the best test, trace and isolate is very, very local. We learned in other diseases like river blindness. River blindness has been fought across the world from a, from a bottom up strategy. I mean, people tried to do it top down. The World Bank tried to do it top down. It didn't work. And we've ended up with a strategy which starts with each village's community health worker. And it's been built bottom up because those are the people that are trusted and those are the people that can deliver. So my hope is that we'll see coming out of this a pandemic preparedness model, which has this powerful bottom up investment, investment not in national government fancy technologies, but investment in local health workers that are trusted and that can go and help the community to contain the next pandemic, which might not be one to which there is a vaccine. Well, uh, I think, Nairi, I think we are running out of time. Uh, I don't know who's, I'm moderating this discussion. I don't know who's moderating the time. Chawang uh, <laughs> Do we have more time? Well, until we, uh, Naira, I hope you have time. I certainly have, and I, uh, I have many, many, many questions for you. Uh, <laughs> but one question that uh, I might put you on the spot uh, is Lee Kuan Yew mm -hmm. wrote this bestseller from third world to first, uh, how he developed Singapore uh, within a generation. I wonder if you can, if, if, if you were the head of government in a, in a small country, uh, what would you do to take that country in terms of governance, mm. just in terms of government and governance structure? Uh, what would your ideal government structure uh, form be to take any of the many poor countries from third world to first if not in a generation, at least in a lifetime. I say this in all sincerity, Nairi, because, I mean, even today, one in five or six people are living below the poverty line in the world. A good 120 odd countries are still considered developing. And developing is a clean way, politically correct way of saying third world, a poor country, living in a poor country. And I don't see many Singapore's where a country grows from the third world to the first within a generation. What is wrong and what can be done? What would you do? Mm -hmm. So you touched there. It's a question I have thought a lot about in building the school of government and thinking about what are the qualities that we need for people who are going to govern in whatever country they're governing. And for me, it comes down to three things. And they're the values of the school and they're the values that we try to help people strengthen in themselves before they go into public leadership. And it's funny because they, they, they come from me flicking over, turning upside down what people hate about their political leaders. People hate their political leaders for being self-serving, for being corrupt and for being incompetent. So my thing is let's tip that over and think about what, what it is that that means that people really want their leaders to be. And the first is not self-serving. What does it really mean to serve others? What is the evidence that people serve others? How many people at the end of each year can sit down and say, what decisions did I make this year that put 
the interests of others ahead of my own, that put the interests of my institution ahead of my own? Is there enough of a gap between in some key decisions? And I do this for myself each year, because in my view, if at the end of the year you say, no, every single decision was good for me and good for my institution and good for my community, then you've lost the plot, right? You've become one of those leaders who thinks that there's no different, you know, what is good for them is good for the country. That's not good. The second is about integrity. What, it, what does it mean not to be corrupt? More importantly, what does it mean? None of you on this call would, would, would want to trust me if I started explaining to you that I didn't steal money yesterday and I didn't steal money. It's not about not being corrupt. It's about having integrity. And having integrity to me means two things. It means having a deep set of principles that you use to make decisions and being prepared every time you make a decision to give your reason for the decision. And that is not easy because sometimes we don't know why we're making a decision. It just feels right. But if we can dig deep and find the simple, clear reason for that decision, we help build a culture around us that reinforces those reasons for making decisions. And that's actually really important for building integrity. And the other side for me of integrity is integrity has two meanings in English. One is not corrupt, but the other is being whole. And it's respecting the wholeness of other people, respecting the wholeness of their culture, of their being, and treating people with that respect, reaching out to understand what their integrity is so that you can interact with integrity. And the third, the third quality, which for me is really foundational to good government is competence. Where competence doesn't mean getting a first class degree from Oxford. Competence, um, it's not about how much you know. Competence for me is very simply defined as whether you know what you don't know and whether you know how to find out. Do you know that you don't understand the poorest people in Bhutan? And do you know how to find out what their problems are? Do you know how to find out the impact on them of a measure that you're about to take? And can you find that out in a second? Not by commissioning a report that you'll get in seven years time, but do you know how to find out immediately? And to me, though that's competence, knowing what you don't know and knowing how to find out at speed. And do you teach those at the Blatnavik School of Government? We certainly Is do our possible? best. We okay. do our best to teach those three things every day with everybody that walks through our doors. Nairi, uh, we are flooded with questions. Can you take a few? Of course. Please. It's my so honor. we have uh, one, looks like from a student. How can we incorporate technology more efficiently in teaching and learning process during lockdown? Mm. How can we incorporate technology yeah, uh, in the teaching and learning process during lockdown? Yeah. I also want to add another dimension to this question. Uh, if, we, if technology is the use of digital technology as we, as we know it today, how soon should we expose our students to learning digital technology? Is it necessary? Mm. Um, so the first of those questions about how we use technology and learning. So I'm not an expert on that. Um, um, but I can tell you, I can share with you what we've learned as a school who's been teaching online and offline and in hybrid for a year and experimenting. And that's that technology to be good needs to be very interactive. So you need to be reaching out to people and saying, Namge, you don't look very convinced about that, you know, or Sange, you know, you're, you're concentrating hard. Is this something that interests you? You need to be calling people in. So what we've done with our technology is in the school is create screens where people's face are a life size. So that even if I'm the only person in the classroom, I can see everybody's faces and um, some people might find it rude, but it does mean that I am constantly saying to my students, hey, you're reading, that looks good. What is it you're reading? <laughs> so that we can just, so that they, they know that I know that they're there. And, and, and we forget that teaching in my view is part 
effective. It's partly about having information and helping somebody else have it, but it's a big part affective. And what makes students really excel is they're often, it's their relationship with their teacher. And, and if we don't think about that online, we're gonna lose that learning experience. So like governance, what you're saying is technology should not replace, perhaps even cannot replace the trusted <laughs> human element. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think there are some things, um, maths, where online learning can really help people. Um, I used to tutor maths um, when I was at high school. And what fascinated me is people's brains, I, in my belief, absolutely everybody in the world can do mathematics. It's just that people's brains work differently. Some people are very visual, some people are very numeric, you know, and, and, and so what's fascinating is understanding how somebody's mind is working and helping them get to where they get to. What that means is that people block, if you, I'm sure you've all watched children learning maths, people block at different moments. And so online is actually wonderful. If they go onto something like the Khan Academy and they can redo a step mm -hmm. 50 times without being embarrassed that they're holding up a class or that they're asking the teacher the same thing over and over again. So for th some things, Technology is really a magical way of learning. Um, what it doesn't teach us very well is to read other human beings, to work with other human beings, to be, I don't think it's teaching us EQ. It's too transactional for that. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm concerned that technology is just increasing the divide that exists among countries and within countries. And uh, what you've said now is uh, giving me cause for even more concern because technology by itself is not enough. Technology must be interactive, which becomes even more inaccessible to the poor. Yeah. And look, you know, I'm, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because this, this year of the pandemic has so shown us that, you know, there's... Um, I think it's 10% of children in the United Kingdom, one of the richest countries in the world, do not have regular access to the internet for learning. And yet our school curriculum depends upon them having that kind of access. So we have set them up to fail right from the start. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, we have the Blavatnik School, you know, there is a team of researchers that we have in Ghana at the moment that are looking at how to use technology to help the poorest communities catch up after COVID, how to help the teachers prepare to catch up their students. So again, it's always this story of, yes, technology can help, but it takes a lot of human intention to make it helpful. It takes a lot of care to think does the infrastructure reach everybody? Does everybody have access? You know, we've all seen the photographs of those young school students in America who are sitting outside on the pavement outside Pizza Hut because that's the only place that they can get an internet connection. Compare that to Singapore where Wi-Fi is everywhere, high speed and free for everybody. You know, you mentioned Lee Kuan Yew before and there is a lot about Singapore I admire but just two things I would mention about government and making government effective. Lee Kuan Yew was famous for cracking down on corruption. And one of the first things he did was put his own childhood friends in prison for corruption. That is a huge signal to the rest of the elite that nobody gets away with it. A second thing that I find fascinating about Singapore is that I've never been a big believer in performance pay because I think it corrupts people's values about why they do their job. But there's one performance pay in the world that I really approve of, and it's for senior civil servants in Singapore, one part of their pay is benchmarked against the, the poorest 20% of Singaporeans' well-being. And I think that's a very good indicator of the effectiveness of government, because after all, it's the most vulnerable in our countries that depend most on government. And linking, linking the, the, the pay of the most senior people in government 
to what's happening to those people seems to me a good accountability mechanism. Mm -hmm. A little bit of that is creeping into the corporate world too. Mm -hmm. A little bit. <laughs> Too little. <laughs> a very little bit. Uh, I'm afraid I don't know the people who are, uh, the, the names of the people who are asking the questions don't come to me. So uh, the, one of the questions is, how is the AI that is being developed in China different from the one designed in the West? What will its implications for the rest of the world be? Mm -hmm. So I think the AI in, um, I, I'm not so sure that there is a big difference. I think there's a difference in usage, not in development. I see the Google labs and the Alibaba labs, you know, competing very strongly. And in fact, there are some Google labs that have been in China. I mean, they're all competing very strongly on some of the same technologies. I mentioned facial recognition earlier. You know, that's, that's huge. Um, and it's, it's, it's got huge potential, good consequences and terrifying consequences for societies. And both in the United States and in uh, China, we're seeing um, huge research efforts go on. How it is that governments choose to use technology, whether you use facial recognition, for example, across your entire population, for what? Some people would say, we can use it for good mental health reasons, right? We can use this technology to ensure that people who are on the brink get help. Companies are saying, we can use it to ensure worker safety, because you can see when somebody's tired and if they're on a machine that's unsafe, you can intervene to stop an accident at work happening. On the terrifying side is the idea that there is a kind of coercive control, not a, not a consent, but a coercive control of people, which comes about through being able to be so doing a surveillance, which is 24 seven, um, and which is monitoring their emotions, their, their thoughts, their mental state. And that's, I think, well, certainly for my generation, that's pretty terrifying. Well, for any generation that studied George Orwell's 1984, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think is uh, uh, enough reason to keep us up at night. Uh, AI seems so inevitable and it can do so much good. Uh, yet at the same time, uh, if we can't get governments right, if we can't convince leaders that they need to step down and abide by the rule of law, how on earth are we going to restrict the use of AI for good purposes in government and to prevent the use of AI from becoming something like an Orwellian state? Well, so it's quite hard to use technology only in one direction. And so when I look at the way AI has been used in governments that have used it as a, as a means of control, so I'm thinking about Gulf states here. What's interesting is that it's also opened up a feedback loop from the population to the government. So, so the more the government has used technology to link itself to the people, the more it's also created a feedback loop from the people back to government and, and, and an expectation of participation and an expectation um, of that, that the feedback will be taken seriously. Um, but I don't think, you know, the, if I look at technology through time, every technology, the printing press in the 17th century, you know, when, when we had a printing press, it led to people pamphleteering, producing scurrilous lies, and it nearly caused a war between France and Britain. And so they had to introduce legislation that said you have to take responsibility for what you're publishing. And likewise with radio and television, when radio was, was, was invented and then television, people said this is an authoritarian's dream because an authoritarian can use television just to broadcast what they want and control the minds of the population. And it didn't become that. And it didn't become that because human beings have an amazing ability to subvert technologies and to use them in different ways to, 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 to um, fend off coercion. So mm -hmm. 
Although I think there's huge reason to worry about the way these technologies can concentrate and lead to very coercive power in states, my optimism comes looking at history and thinking about the way every technology that people have worried about has human beings have found a way to kind of subvert and to reassert um, the need for consent and government. Mary, it's 3 p.m. in Bhutan. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've taken so much of your time. Can you take just one more question? Of course. Okay, Namge Chodin has been raising her hand virtually. And now uh, we're gonna hand over the mic to Namge for a question. Uh, hello, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Namge and uh, I am a public servant, but before that, I spent uh, four years in Singapore. So the whole conversation on uh, Singapore particularly got me very excited. Um, my question is, how do you look at um, emulating best practices in governance? And I'd like to give a little bit more context on why I am asking this question. Uh, so um, I can see that a lot of us, and especially in Bhutan, we look at uh, Singapore as a country that is worthy of um, emulating uh, many things. Um, but I always like to come in and temper the enthusiasm because I, after, after living there, I do believe that we have to be very cognizant of the very um, unique um, cultural and historical contexts that have led to that particular um, trajectory for Singapore and that may not necessarily work for a country like Bhutan. And I'm sure a lot of people come to the Bhavatnik school um, to, to share ideas and to find out some common ways that we can um, learn from each other so um, yeah, my question is, um, you know, how do you look at uh, emulating best practices in governance? Yeah, um, thank you, Namge. That's a, that's a great question. Um, all over the world, people are always looking for the magic bullet or the silver bullet or the, the perfect, you know, template. And of course there is no blueprint for the world over because this whole discussion and it's anchoring in trust tells us why there's no blueprint. People need to know and feel part of their system of governance in order to, to, to trust it. Um, the other thing I would say looking at Singapore is Singapore now faces some very new challenges. And it's a high, it, it, it underscores for us that there is no, a country cannot imagine that it has stumbled on the solution and from then on will be fine. Democracy is a living being. It's like a plant. It needs watering every day. It needs caring for every day. And that's, that's what, in my view, the last five years have shown us. The, the backlash, the storming of the Capitol in, 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 in Washington, D.C., the, the, um, the transformation across every European country where the establishment political parties all failed to win majorities in the last elections. All of that is underlines for us that democracies in some parts of the world became very complacent and they took for granted the consent of the people and you just can't. So democracy is, a, is it needs feeding, it needs evolving every day with every new challenge. And what, what is good for Singapore is the fact that public service is very high status in Singapore. And it's not because they pay, people keep saying it's because they pay their public servants so much. That's not actually true. The Singaporean civil service will tell you that they take the market rate and they reduce it by 40%. And they call that the status kind of, the, the, the public service um, status piece. It, but it's it's the, the, the social status of being a public servant in Singapore is very high. And that means it continues to attract very good who can work hard to find solutions, even to the new problems that they've got now. I hope that helps. I thought, I thought, your, uh, I thought Nairi, your immediate answer to Namge's question was going to be, lock up your childhood friend. <laughs> <laughs> and take it on from there. <laughs> uh, Nairi, thank you so much. I enjoyed this discussion.
Uh, I don't want to impose on your time any longer. Uh, thank you so very much for visiting us virtually in Bhutan. I hope that you will visit us in person and I hope that we can continue this conversation in person in Bhutan. And as for me, I look forward to visiting you at your school uh, at the earliest possible. So again, Larry, thank you so very much for sharing your, giving us your time, making this time, giving us your time and sharing your knowledge with us all over the world, but especially those of us in Bhutan. Thank you very much. Tering, it's such a pleasure. And I really look forward to coming to Bhutan, but to hosting as many Bhutanese as will come and visit us in Oxford. Uh, we've had students from Bhutan and Oxford that have been outstanding. So, you know, encourage those you know to come study with us um, and stay well. It's just been a, a great privilege to take part in this conversation with you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the people who stayed on. Only, I think only three of you left and many joined during the course of our discussions. Uh, a big tribute to Nairi out there. Uh, we've had tons of questions and my deepest apologies to each and every one of you who have sent questions. Uh, let's see what we can do uh, about those questions. Perhaps I'll email them to Nairi. <laughs> <laughs> So once again, thank you very much, one and all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.